and welcome to 2019. Oh my goodness. So thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for giving a chance to listen to this. My name is John. I was trained as a pastor, and this is one of the ways in which I am trying to do something good with the skills I got. So this is, I started this maybe a little more than two years ago. This is an ambushed podcast, and it was a name that I came up with based off of a nickname that I have. And uh, I really thought it would be cool to make some episodes about things that ambushed me, things that surprised me, particularly relating to Christianity. Now, there's kind of a reason for that, and it's because I have always grown up and been a part of the Christian tradition. And so what happens is, ugh, after a while, you start to hear the same tropes or the same angles over and over. And I got really interested in paying attention to people that had a unique angle. I'm like, man, that'd be so fun to try to do something with a creative angle. And so that's what this is. So thank you for listening. And uh, I meant to get started earlier this year, but I've been pretty sick and coughing and sneezing and just not good. But I'm really quite happy to finally be back at it. And uh, this is going to be the first of a series. And... This one and the next three are going to all be about the book of Jonah, which is only four chapters, but it is one of the best books of the entire Old Testament and from all of ancient literature. It seems like everyone knows the story of Jonah, but what I want to do is talk about it in a surprising way that hopefully will ambush you, I guess, (laughs) whatever you want to say. So this one is called... He ran from his job. And all we're going to do is read through the first chapter. And then next one, we'll read through chapter two, and then three, and then four in the next few episodes. So buckle in. I hope this is going to be entertaining because it was at least entertaining for me to read through this story yet again. So that's the intro. Let's do this. And uh, I want to give a quick shout out, I guess, to uh, Liz and to Dave and then a few other people who have said that they've been waiting for me to come back and do a few more episodes. So if you're going to listen to this, you're probably smiling already. So thank you for reminding me that people really do enjoy this. So thank you. But let's get into Jonah. Now... Jonah is one of those books of the Old Testament where, uh, I guess you could say it's kind of like a cartoon. It's, it is a story where there's a man who gets swallowed by a whale, and then he gets spit back up. And that's kind of the only part of the story that people know. But that's only chapter 2 of 4 chapters. And so what happens in chapter 1? What happens in chapter 3 and 4? Because this story is just bonkers. It's off the wall. And in fact, uh, some people have placed this to a certain time period because in the book of 2 Kings, it says uh, in chapter 14, he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo to Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So in 2 Kings, there's one verse, one reference that anchors this person of Jonah to a specific time during the reign of the kings of Israel. Other than that, There is no other reference to Jonah in the Old Testament, but then Jesus quotes, at least his story, he doesn't quote Jonah directly, but quotes the story of Jonah as he's railing against the Pharisees. So what we're going to do is I've got a number of notes here, and I've written out some specific things just to call out, but really 
I'm just going to read through chapter one and make some commentaries along the way. And then at the end of each of these episodes, I've got a few things just to say bullet points, like boom, boom, boom. All right. And listen, if you are someone who identifies as religious or not, I don't really care because I think anyone can read this book. And in fact, no matter what your background is, you can listen to this story of Jonah and get good things out of it. So if you're not religious, don't worry, because I actually have this ongoing theory that the Bible is meant for people who are non-religious. And, uh, well, I could go into an argument about whether or not everyone is actually religious, but I'll save that for some other day. That should be its own episode, maybe when this Jonah series is done. All right? And uh, one final comment, sorry. Just before we get started, I think the story of Jonah is one that's best understood imagining that we are sitting around a bonfire. Because as we go through these chapters, you're going to start to feel like, man, this story gets more and more ridiculous as it goes on. And guess what? You're right. And there's a reason for that. And you're going to find out by chapters three and four, oh, it's building to something here. In fact, it's got a, this whole book of Jonah has got a crescendo that's just sheer lunacy and hilarity. All right. So hopefully you're already interested in Jonah, but now even more so. So let's Start with verse 1. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because of its wickedness, because its wickedness has come up before me. Pause. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire back in the day, and the Assyrians were known as being terrible. In fact, the Assyrian Empire would go and destroy a whole town and then make a pile of all the skulls of the people. Then they would go to the next town, grab the mayor or king, drag him back to the other town and show him the pile of skulls and say, if you don't just give up, We will do the same thing to your town, to your city that we just did here. Do you want a pile of skulls? And of course they would say no. And so the Assyrian Empire was known as being atrocious, terrible, wreaking havoc. And here is Jonah being told to go into the heart of it and talk to its main, its capital, talk to the king. Like, oh my goodness. So he's being sent right into the center of everything. And this is only verse 1 and 2. Starting verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, which was south. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and called for Tarshish, To flee from the Lord. Pause. I think we've got to pay attention to the first word. But Jonah decides to do the opposite of what a prophet does. And in fact, here we are in verse 3. And Jonah is being shown not to be a prophet, but to be an anti-prophet. We're only at verse 3. And so Jonah is known for being a prophet. He's got a call that's been put upon him to go speak to this whole capital city of the worst empire. And he runs in the opposite direction. Jonah is a failure of a prophet in this moment. Verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, Ruach, and sent such a violent storm And such a violent storm arose that the ship was threatened to break up. 
All of the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Pause. You know it's a bad storm when even sailors are afraid. You feel me? Not only that, but Jonah, right here, he goes downstairs in the boat and he's asleep during a storm. So much so that then the captain goes and finds him and has to wake him up saying, how can you be sleeping through this? Well, one of the tendencies or one of the the symptoms of being depressed is long amounts of sleep. And so there's a there might be a, a call out here that maybe with today's understanding of psychology, we could look back and say, Jonah's probably depressed. He's sleeping through some crazy, crazy adventures that are happening, some chaos that's right above him. So there might be some chance that even by verse 5, 6, what is this? Yeah, f- sorry, 5 and 6, that Jonah's already experiencing depression for being an anti-prophet. He's, he's got this deep level of existential dread because he is not fulfilling what his job is. Hmm. Let's keep going. Verse 7. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let's, let us cast lots to find who is responsible for this calamity. So they're going to throw some dice. They cast lots, and on the lot fell Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And so they are railing into him. They are trying to ask him every question possible, interrogating right here. He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? As if all of this was all in Jonah. They knew that he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. So they asked him the questions to answers they already knew. Who are you? Where are you from? What are you doing? And he had already told them, I'm a prophet, and I'm running away from my job. My boss gave me a task, and I'm doing the exact opposite. I think it's really profound here, because here are some indigenous people. It does not say that they are Hebrews, but they are calling him into question. In fact, these people who are not Hebrews are asking the faithful questions. Oh. You see, this might be a crazy, really good storytelling around a bonfire because even though it's anchored in 2 Kings that there was a person, Jonah, son of Amittai, this is storytelling at its best. Let's keep going. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea. You can hear that there is some depression behind that statement. It was almost suicidal. He replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. So in light of their interrogation, in light of these non-Hebrews asking the faithful questions, this anti-prophet is starting to recognize what he has brought. Now, I think we also need to take a moment and realize that 
when you run away from God rather than toward, you are inviting back the primal chaos. And I say that because in, in previous episodes, you might have remembered that Genesis 1, the opening poem of the Bible, has got a segment in it where it talks about this watery, chaotic entity that God has to put boundaries on and set to the side, and then he starts creating in the poem. Any movement away from God is like you're headed in the same direction as that primal, chaotic void that existed back in Genesis 1. And so Jonah, by not doing his job, he invited the primal chaos chaos by going against the Lord's order. Water, storms, chaos, flood, all of these things are connected with death, with destruction, with lack of control. And so the fact that a storm drops down on Jonah, it's, it might be because he has gone against the direction that God had want him, wanted him to go. You see, there's echoes of Genesis 1 happening even in the first chapter of Jonah. Let's go to verse 13. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. They didn't throw Jonah overboard. But they couldn't. Because the storm grew even wilder than before. Even wilder. Then they cried out to the Lord. The non-Hebrews called out to the Hebrew God. Uh Uh-oh. You hear that? Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. The non-Hebrews call out on the Hebrew God for some level of patience, compassion, for some level of understanding, and They are just doing what the prophet told them to do because he said, just throw me overboard and everything will get better for everyone. The words of a depressed anti-prophet, huh? At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish (laughs) to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The first 16 verses of the book of Jonah don't even have the whale in it. Yet most people only know about the whale. They have, maybe it's you and certainly it was me at some point that There was little understanding that this guy was an anti-prophet. He was probably depressed. He invited the primal chaos from the beginning of creation, the Genesis 1 poem. He invited that chaotic disorder to surround him because he went against the direction of the Lord. And then the non-Hebrews start to repent and they turn back to God faster than the prophet did. The pagans, which is a word I don't like to use, but the indigenous people, they didn't, no, they did return back to Yahweh before even the prophet did. You see, this story is amazing. It's an, it's like masterful masterful storytelling done. Now, just want to make a comment. It wasn't uncommon back in the day that you offered a sacrifice or an offering to the God that you angered. Okay? This was pretty common. And let's be honest, we still kind of do it today. When you make somebody angry 
and you know it's your fault, you try to appease them by giving them a gift. Be like, listen, I'm sorry. I did something over the top, and this is to try to make up for it. So, I mean, that human interaction still exists today. So let's maybe not look down on these people as being too primitive because we still do it today. We try to appease the people that we have angered. But you got to pay attention. The Hebrew God, nowhere in these first 16 chapters, said, I want a sacrifice. And nowhere in the first 16 or even 17 verses of chapter 1 does he even say, I want you to throw Jonah overboard. So we're left with a question here. In verse 17, when the Lord sends the Hadag Hagadol, which is uh, Hebrew for the big, the fish, the big fish. Did he send the fish as punishment, as further punishment on top of and beyond the storm? Or did he send the Hadag Hagadol to protect him from the storm? Ah, now we're getting somewhere. But we have to stop there because then we'd be going into chapter two and that's next week. So here's a few things just to pay attention to. One, Jonah runs in the opposite direction because the Lord wants to give grace to the terrible. The Lord wants to give good things in some capacity to his enemies, and so he runs in the opposite direction. That tells you something about the divine. The divine loves our enemies more than we want the divine to. Does that make sense? Two, these non-Hebrews show better faith than the professional Hebrew. (laughs) These sailors are more devout and turn to the Lord faster than this prophet does. So now we're already starting to have like a type, anti-type, like who's the real hero in this story? Because so far, Jonah doesn't seem like the hero. Third point, be careful of running in the opposite direction of where you're supposed to be going because you might be inviting the primal, chaotic disorder that existed at the beginning of creation into your life. And I've been saying this in like a number of different spheres, but if you are not chasing after health and holiness, then that means you're headed towards unhealth and let's say profanity, I guess. Being profane, being unsacred, desacred, maybe, yeah, desecrated, desacred, that'd be better. If you're headed towards unhealth or desecration, You've just got to be careful because you're contending with something primal when you start heading in the opposite direction of divine order and divine uh, structure. And just, man, you better know what you're calling down upon yourself if you're headed away from health and holiness intentionally. And then, last thought, When the chaos drops on you that you legitimately brought upon yourself and then something comes along that seems like it's completely deus ex machina, which is Latin for uh, the machine that would drop the god figure into a play to save the day, uh, back in Greek days, or Roman days, I guess. It would be something to pay attention to because you've got to ask yourself when everything's falling apart or when there's absolute chaos happening, there's absolute disorder and disarray. You've got to ask yourself, is this big fish that just flopped around and swallowed me whole? Is this thing for my salvation or damnation? And then, oh man, sit in the experience of that fish. 
Next time, we're going to go through chapter two in the same way, and I hope you enjoy it just as much because this, we're only a quarter of the way through Jonah, and it's already got me riled up with more energy than I started this episode with. So thank you for listening. We'll be back in a little bit. Check in next week, and we will start with chapter two. You are a delight. May grace and peace be with you.